the Americans and the Europeans are the only ones who haven't caught it that it's over. That game is over. We are now in a disorder trying to look for a new multipolar world order because there are challenges coming up. China is challenging and rivaling the, the U.S. And there is a conflict of interests and it's about power and influence and rivalry. And I started to write about coming wars in 2018 and, and people laughed at me and, and here we are. And I think we will see more of the wars because the world policeman is considered weak. In this video, Felix Zulov discusses the dramatic shift from a unipolar world dominated by the United States to a complex multipolar geopolitical landscape. He explores the decline of U.S. influence and the emergence of new global players marking a period of unprecedented change. Zulov will delve into how this shift affects international relations, economics, and the global power balance, providing insights into the future of global diplomacy and conflict. Join him as he navigates through these transformative times, offering a comprehensive analysis of the evolving world order. I have to start with the geopolitical setup, because the geopolitical world order has changed. For many decades, actually since World War II, we had a unipolar world in the Western world, unipolar system that was very U.S.-centric, and the U.S. was a hegemon, and the U.S. could really move and shake the world the way they liked. And when the wolf came down and, and, and we globalized, it was a U.S.-centric unipolar world, big world order. And I think the Americans and the Europeans are the only ones who haven't caught it that it's over. That game is over. We are now in a disorder trying to look for a new multipolar world order because there are challenges coming up. China is challenging and rivaling the, the U.S., and there is a conflict of interests, and it's about power and influence and rivalry. And I started to write about coming wars in 2018, and, and people laughed at me, and, and here we are. And I think we will see more of the wars because the world policeman is considered weak. And when the U.S. foreign minister uh, is kept waiting in front of MBS in Saudi Arabia, the the mover and shaker there tells you he tells you that the respect has gone down and when <clears throat> blinken travels to turkey and he's not received by erdogan he's not received by the prime minister not by the foreign minister and eventually he's received by the deputy mayor of istanbul that tells you what's going on in the world and i think i think the americans are not aware of this and the Europeans are also not aware of this. They just hide behind the, the big friend overseas. And, and that's what it is. This all means that everybody is trying to reposition itself in an upcoming new world order. And that new world order will be found by going through a lot of stressful moments. And it could be sorted out in diplomacy. But if it's not sorted out in diplomacy, then it sorted out in wars. And I recently talked to Neil Ferguson, uh, who now has a very similar view than I have on the world. And, and, and he was much more moderate uh, a year ago. And, and he said, when I asked him, where are those diplomats? He said, there aren't any. We don't have them. So therefore, the risk of war, of continued war and intensifying war and conflict is very high. You also have to understand that if that is the situation as I describe it, then all the underlying conflicts that were on, underneath the surface so far, like in Azerbaijan and Armenia or in Guyana or in Serbia or what have you, will eventually come to the surface because they do not respect the former leader anymore and they feel they can act as they like.
Yeah, because it feels like the policeman is not on his beat anymore. The policeman is gone. The big gorilla around the block is very weak. And therefore, it's a different world. It's a very volatile and unstable world in geopolitical terms. And geopolitics for the financial markets usually is not of great importance. When you have an event, it's for one day or two days or so, and then it is back to normal. But this time, I think it really begins to impact the longer term structural setup of the world economy. And that means the intensifying rivalry will lead to more sanctions, more protectionism, more nationalism, and things like that. And that is going to make business much more difficult for multinational companies operating throughout the world. And and I think the market is not discounting that yet. And when you look at it historically, the market only price that in with a time lag. It is not a leading factor in structural shifts. It is a leading factor in cyclical shifts, but not in structural shifts. And I think investors should be aware of that because at some point of time, that will get priced into the markets and will lead to higher inflation and lower lower valuation, higher interest rates and things like that. That's the world we operate in. And in that world, we have a business cycle. And that business cycle has been highly distorted by the pandemic. And we are still trying to sort things out. Uh, And uh, the market is now celebrating uh, a more dovish Fed. Uh, I think uh, the market doesn't understand yet that uh, interest rates uh, can decline. And so can stock prices together with interest rates. So... If we have a soft landing next year, then declining interest rates are very bullish for the markets. If we have a recession next year, then we have declining interest rates and declining stock prices at some point of time. And when you look at it historically, soft landings are very rare. And soft landing for next year is a major consensus. So when I look at what the the global fund managers are saying and what the major consensus is and how money is positioned, it is very long bonds, very aggressive in declining interest rates and very bullish stocks and soft landing. That's the big picture and that's how the world is positioned. I think over the year end, uh, you see from the late October lows, you see a medium term up leg. You think it's the third medium term up leg and the normal bull cycle has three up legs. Disbelief, belief, overbelief. And I think we are going or we are now in the getting the overbelief phase that will probably peak sometimes in the first quarter. I cannot say early or late uh, first quarter. I'm leaning to late first quarter because the momentum is quite good. And uh, the liquidity situation over year end is relatively generous. The Fed probably underestimated bank reserves and and they didn't want to run into a a tightness problem over year end. And therefore, like in Y2K, 1999, 2000, they are providing liquidity generously and the decline in reverse repos is adding, etc. And this creates the ammunition of markets going higher. If we extrapolate the decline in reverse repos, which has been the major contributor to liquidity growth for financial markets, then the decline should be over by late first quarter. It's going down the drain. You know, this is what happens when you have some uh, childish people running the government. They destroy everything. And Merkel started actually with the nonsense. And they just accelerated it and uh, made it worse. Germany is not competitive anymore. Germany has underperformed Italy for uh, almost four years now, uh, economically, and that will continue. Uh, they are, when you look at unit labor costs, etc. Germany is outpriced. They are not competitive anymore. Uh, they and the industry is adapting to that. They are moving production to other places, uh, particularly energy-intensive production. They move to other places because it's energy prices that is a a real killer in in Germany. And, of course, you have the Czech Republic, you have Poland, 
you have Hungary. Those places are competitive places and they do good work and they are uh, reliable. They are reliable manufacturers, probably even more than, than Northern Africa, I would say. So I think Eastern Europe is a beneficiary, but to a limited extent because of Russia. I think yeah. the Western narrative that Russia will eventually conquer Europe again, I think that's nonsense. I think this is being misused by the Americans to, to keep the Europeans on their side and, and help them, etc. I, I think that narrative is completely nonsense. The Russians wanted to do business. Putin wanted to do business with the West. Uh, I uh, listened to his speech when he came into power in the German parliament in 2001. And it was obvious he wanted to do business with the West. And he tried and he, he tried many times. Germany did some more business with them, but the U.S. were against that. And the U.S. were against North Stream Pipeline and all that kind of stuff because of what I described as the Euro, Eurasian continental plate and what it could mean for integration and for the influence of the U.S. that would decline. So I think the, the U.S. just didn't like that, and therefore they are spreading that narrative, which is, in my view, completely wrong. I think they uh, want to develop their economy, and <clears throat> I do not know Russia very well. I've been to Moscow once and to the Kremlin once, and, uh, and uh, I do not know the country. But I speak to people who know the country, Westerners who tra travel the country, and they say, <clears throat> you can go to many cities in, in uh, Russia, even further east, uh, that are very modern and where you have top uh, quality in terms of restaurants and hotels and service and uh, infrastructure. I think we get in the West, we get the mainstream media's view that the Russians are so bad, etc. Of course, they are an emerging country and probably ever will be because their main products are commodities and warfare, in a way. There are no consumer products they, they can sell in the market. But I think the Russians are not dangerous. Uh, all you have to do is you have to deal with them. You have to trade with them. And I think they would be a good partner. They, they had been a reliable partner up to the point when, when they were provoked with Ukraine NATO membership. If you believe that eventually we go down the inflationary path, as we described, and into a big crisis, uh, gold could also fall in that situation. It could also fall. You you do not know, and 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 stocks could also fall. But eventually, even if you have a currency reform at some point, eventually real assets recover. Nominal assets don't. Nominal assets are done. So I would definitely stay away from what is now the big trade, long bonds. It is a trade. It's not an investment. It's a trade and it's not an investment. Recently, JP Morgan uh, Treasury Desk uh, made a survey among their treasury clients. They have the highest treasury allocation, treasury bond allocation ever in the last 25 years. You know, that, that tells you that this trade is on the books of virtually everyone who is a little bit aggressive in the market. So I think we have more to go. I, I thought we can go down to 370 and then maybe to 3% or so for the cycle, around 3%. But after that, it's all the way up to new highs. And in stocks, you know, I, I think you have to own productive investments. Uh, of course, stocks can go down 50%, you know, anytime in that crisis that I described or more, but they will come back. And, and therefore, I think you have to time it. We cannot sell at the ultimate peaks and, and buy at the ultimate bottoms. But if we can take out a big chunk of in between the peaks and the bottoms, then I think we can have a very nice decade of good returns. And if you don't do that and you just sit in a passive portfolio, you run the risk of really selling out at the worst moment of history when it looks darkest. And, and I, I think that's the biggest risk of less experienced investors.